Hi everyone, today I want to provide a crash course in CFD. I know it's a little bit of a backtrack compared to some of my other videos that show hands-on tutorials, but I think it's really important, especially since I often get the same types of questions relating to CFD when someone maybe tries to apply what I've shown in other videos to a slightly different simulation case. And so a lot of times I think it's important to understand the basics when tackling more complex problems than what I've shown. So I'm creating this video kind of geared towards students, engineering teams at universities, and people that are trying to tackle entry level CFD problems, whether it's for research or industry. I want to preface this to say that I'm not an expert in CFD. I don't have a PhD just yet, um, but I am a graduate student who've had a few years of experience with CFD, applied it to research and industry. And so everything I'm saying is from my own experience and I could definitely be wrong and I'll try to apply and provide as much resources in the description and things that can help other people get a better understanding. So definitely don't cite this video. I'd highly recommend people trying to fact check me um, because I might be wrong. I might stumble on my words, um, but hopefully this can be a great crash course for people that maybe was just thrown on the CFD team for the engineering team or someone that wants to learn CFD maybe from an FEA background or a mechanical background. So let's dive straight into it. So, you know, first off, purely introductory, what is CFD? CFD, as many of you guys may know, is computational fluid dynamics, and it's a powerful tool to simulate and analyze fluid systems. That's really kind of the synonym, which is to simulate. And so fluid systems include aerodynamics, um, fluid dynamics, combustion systems, and much more. Traditionally, I believe fluid dynamics would refer to a liquid. Aerodynamics would refer to a gas like air. Um, but in the physical sense, they behave very similar, similarly and can be simulated with CFD. Uh, most importantly, this can be integrated into the mechanical design process for almost anything that travels in a fluid or gas. So airplanes, cars, motorcycles, really anything can be done with CFD. You know, dropping a ball can be done on a CFD, even though that kind of has an analytical solution, you could do a CFD analysis on that too. So what's kind of needed to do a good CFD simulation? First off is kind of a fundamental understanding of fluid dynamics and partial differential equations. This understanding is mostly related um, to the fact that CFD simulates the governing equations of fluid dynamics, which, as I'll explain more later, is the Navier-Stokes equation. If you haven't taken fluid dynamics, it's still possible to learn CFD. However, it will be more difficult, and you may be executing simulations where it might be the correct simulations and you might have done everything right. However, you might not truly understand errors that you might encounter on the way, and in the case that you aren't getting the exactly correct answer. So when I learned CFD, to be honest, I actually never took the fluid dynamics. So there were times I had to ask people uh, exactly what my results meant or why I was getting certain types of physical errors. So it would be very helpful to have taken a class in fluid dynamics and partial differential equation. But if you haven't, hopefully I can explain that in a little bit later, or you can uh, look up some of these governing equations and try to understand it on a basic level. In addition to that, you'll need a numerical solver or a commercial CFD solver. Numerical solvers can basically be uh, any type of fancy calculator like MATLAB or Python that you can use to solve the governing equations of fluid dynamics. These ways are usually common in research and academia because uh, these are ways that you can kind of create your own solver and you can have your own different types of numerical factors. However, what's also very common is commercial CFT solvers that have all of these numerical solvers already integrated and you simply have to know which solver you want to choose and what settings you want to play around with. And the most common is ANSYS Fluent and Siemens Star CCM. I personally use ANSYS Fluent. However, I also have used Star CCM, which you can see in one of my videos although all of my other videos are done in ANSYS Fluent, and I believe it's kind of the most popular um, solver out of all of them. In addition, it, you will likely be using a CAD software, meshing software, or post-processing software if you're doing something more advanced, like a full 
a formula cart where you'll have a CAD file with everything and then you'll want to export it into ANSYS or a dedicated meshing software like HyperMesh um, if you wanted to do something very specific because as I'll point out ANSYS Fluent and Star CCM they are very capable however they both have their pros and cons and they both have their limitations so sometimes you might need dedicated softwares for meshing and post-processing even though they both have these capabilities um, I mean especially for CAD you're not going to design a whole car in ANSYS Fluent and Star CCM I, I don't even know if it's possible <laughs> And so you'll likely start there at least, maybe import it in Fluent or Star CCM, um, and then go on there. So the general workflow, as I may be hinted, is first creating a geometry, which is with the CAD software or inside ANSYS Fluent. If it's a basic geometry, then meshing, which I'll explain is dividing up your whole system into smaller parts so that you'll simulate you know, each point in space. Then setting up the solver, for how exactly do you want to allow the computer to you know solve the governing equations and solve numerically um, these governing equations and then the actual solving of the computer <laughs> and then the post-processing for the most part i've labeled in three dots two dots and one dots the difficulty of cfd and the kind of the ranking of what's the hardest what's not so hard what's the easiest so meshing and setting up the solver in my opinion is always the most difficult meshing is something that doesn't seem like it should be a big part of cfd at the beginning because it's not really doing anything with any physics it's kind of like just dividing you know a big fluid system up however it is extremely important so it's very important and it's something that can take, honestly, most of the time in setting up a good CFD simulation is finding a good mesh. Unless it's a very basic geometry, creating the mesh oftentimes is the most difficult part. From there, setting up the solver and knowing exactly which settings to use, which solver to use, what's the most appropriate for your case also takes a lot of time. Um, and understanding and knowledge to make sure that you're setting it up in the most appropriate manner. From there, creating the geometry, in my opinion, is pretty straightforward. If you're doing a car, you should have the car already, you know, made. If you're doing an airfoil, you're probably importing points. If you're doing some type of, you know, maybe a nozzle or something, such as I've shown that in another video, you can create it in another CAD software and then import it. Um, Post-processing also can take some time to learn, um, but solving the actual iterative method is usually something that you just watch the computer do. So in ANSYS Fluent, you can see it, it's kind of already laid out. You start with the geometry, you can create it in, in um, ANSYS, or you can import it and put in this geometry. You can create a mesh. You can also import a, import a mesh. Um, then you set up, set up the simulation in the actual solution. You want to set up the solver, and then you can post-process results. So this is a static structure for FEA, and you can see it's, it's very similar where you have to, in this case, you might have to define engineering data. However, in fluid dynamics, you define, you know, what is the density of air? What is the density of, of a liquid? You can set up those engineering data points inside the solver too. So next point, uh, before we go into it, I'm going to try to really quickly go over what CFD solves. So CFD in the fluid dynamics world solves the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equation is our governing equations and it is it is really the thing everyone has to understand really to do and understand CFD. So to not dumb it out, dumb it down, but to simplify, I pre presented the incompressible laminar flow with constant viscosity Navier-Stokes equation that's derived from the conservation of momentum. This is something that I hope everyone is familiar with. Um, I know I don't always break it down to this mathematical form. And if you add other forcing terms, um, there will be additional terms. You could add, there could be terms on the left and the right of this equation. But this is a governing equation that's derived from conservation of momentum. In three dimension, you have it, you have an X, Y, and a Z component. And so this is something that hopefully everyone has derived and solved. 
because it really is what governs laminar flow. So because you have three variables and three equations, it's possible to solve this and find a specific 100% accurate um, governing equation for basic laminar flows given known boundary conditions. As you learned in differential equation, um, you have second order terms. And so if you give it two boundary conditions, it should be solvable. However, the tricky part comes when you introduce turbulent flow. Turbulent flow, there is, you could write PhDs and you can write books on turbulent flows. And it's something that we as a society of engineers and mathematicians don't fully understand yet. And we're still trying to solve it. It's a million dollar question. And so one of the most simple and the way that 95% of us are going to solve Navier-Stokes equation for turbulent flow is we're going to imagine it as a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation. To do so, we do what's called the Reynolds decomposition such that u or the velocity that is in the Navier-Stokes equation presented here gets decomposed into two parts, an averaged velocity and a fluctuation, which you can see here. I drew two different types of fluctuations that represent different types of turbulent intensity. However, they're both about a average velocity. And so the fact that you have the superposition of average velocity and turbulence kind of makes up what is known as the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. So you can imagine you take a you take equations that have velocities and you simply take one variable and for each time there's a u here you substitute it with two variables and what this does is you have a much more complicated Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation because you decompose it into these two components so if you look purely at the x momentum of laminar flow you initially had something that was solvable you had gravity pressure gradient viscosity and acceleration and the three variables are in the three different directions of velocity however once you introduce the turbulent decomposition or the Reynolds decomposition you now have a bunch of other components of velocity you have averages you have fluctuations and you have the average of fluctuations ultimately it's a difficult and fun <laughs> mathematical problem that I've probably solved just a handful of times but you now have more variables than you have equations the other equation that you now see for is when you introduce conservation of mass or the continuity equation so even in this case you now have more variables than you have equations so you now have something that's unsolvable Thus, you must introduce new equations that are known as the turbulent models. Coming back to the exact workflow, we first start off with the geometry. The geometry is pretty straightforward. And one thing I think was, remember, was a little bit tricky for me to grasp my head around is that you're simulating the fluid, not the object. So in this case, this was my video of the compressible jet. And in this case, I kind of subtracted what the jet is and I'm and I'm simulating the fluid about and around and outside of this jet in the case of an airfoil I'm simulating the kind of the wind tunnel or what would be outside of the airfoil and the air airfoil itself is just the boundary so here we are kind of getting into the fun of CFD or meshing Meshing is when you divide a fluid region into smaller parts or cells to, to solve the governing equations at each point in space. Meshing helps discretize and approximate the values of the turbulent equations through iterative methods. And this is really the only way we can economically perform many CFT simulations. It's theoretically possible to do it not through iterative methods or to solve directly the Navier-Stokes equa equations on the turbulent scales um, for CFT and this is known as direct numerical simulation. However, this the computation of demand to simulate CFT on this scale and time scales is pretty much out of the scope of this presentation and is out of the scope of many computers nowadays and really is only used for academia um, unless one day we have much stronger supercomputers. And so when you divide these cells up, there's different methods. And I'll just leave it to say that there's finite element 
method, finite volume method, and finite difference method. Um, these are different methods that you can solve for each cell within a mesh and it's something that I would recommend people to explore and understand because they do have slight, they have pros and cons in terms of stabilities and solving accuracies and this is something that's out of the scope of this. Uh, but in general for meshing always remember more cells equals increased accuracy but also increased computational demand. So there's always a balance on what is accurate however what can be done in a reasonable amount of time such as you know DNS. DNS in theory is the most accurate you can get however the computational demand is unrealistic it would take years for a simulation like this to be conducted in DNS um, unless you had a huge huge very capable supercomputer so there's always a delicate balance. Next part about meshing and getting to kind of some technicalities is because you want things to be accurate yet computationally lean, cells should be more refined around only the errors of large, larger pressure gradients um, or things where you know something interesting is going to happen such as flaps, sharp edges, bumps, and separation region. For the most part flaps, sharp edges, and bumps all kind of create separation and so they can kind of all fall under separation and so in this case we're an airfoil this is a structured airfoil which is done on ANSYS and this is an unstructured airfoil only in star CCM can you kind of create a or define a wake region like this which is very helpful and so that's why a lot of people actually like star CCM for its kind of better uh, meshing capabilities and so I am expecting a lot of separation in here, and so that's why I, I defined a wake region. In this case, there's kind of a wake region defined immediately behind it. However, these cells are also pretty refined generally, um, but this is kind of also really only good for low angles of attack. If I was to do a higher angle of attack, what this airfoil should have instead is it should have a defined region in the direction of the wake. So. Something I've talked about in other videos is I've also talked about Y plus or first layer height that must be taken into consideration for accurate modeling. In general, Y plus should be less than one for most models, including the Supply Almaris, the K Omega, LES, and DES models. There are ways you can increase Y plus values in case you want to decrease the computation demand where you use wall functions, which are commonly found in the K epsilon models, but also used in the K omega SST model. In this case, you probably still want to use Y plus less than five. Um, and this is something that you would understand more by looking up and knowing the law of the wall, which governs how boundary layers behave and the approximations that are appropriate for different parts of the boundary layers. And this also helps understand why you need to have Y plus less than one for accurate calculation of the boundary layer. And so these are general rules of thumb that you can find on other forums or guides, um, but it really would help to understand the law of the wall that I'm not gonna go into in depth. Um, other parts is I wanna stress that it's extremely important if you wanna do a truly accurate CFD, um, such as a big presentation or a paper to do a CFD independent study. You might not have to report it in a paper, uh, but it's good to explore what that is. So a, see, a mesh independent study is where you increase, well, maybe you start with the mesh, like one of these two, and you increase the cell count by decreasing the size. You can increase the refinement in the um, first layer height or in the region behind it, um, simply just increasing the cells um, by refining it and seeing how that changes the values. If the values don't change after you increase the cells any further, that means you've reached mesh independence. Because in theory, um, as I mentioned, the more cells, the more accurate. So at some point, though, you're also going to reach a point where you're adding more cells, but you're not getting more accurate. So you want to make sure you're in that balance where you're keeping it lean, but you're keeping it accurate. Um, other ways to make sure you, you're having a good mesh is skewness, aspect ratio, orthogonality, and growth ratio. These are some general guidelines, but they can differ widely for different types of applications. Um, so skewness refers to the shape of the cells, 
a structured per perfectly quadrilateral mesh well, should have a skewness of zero because everything is perfectly square but nothing will ever be that perfect so ideally you want things as low as possible i believe skewness is on a scale of zero to one for triangular me triangular and tetrahedral meshes you will probably want to keep skewness under 0.9 um, but i traditionally keep with structured meshes that have good skewness so i don't usually have to worry about it and this is something you guys should look up aspect ratios is refers to the ratio of the length and the height of the cell and generally should be kept you know in check of less than 35 i've sometimes seen 50 um, but it could be larger if it's in the direction of the flow if you look at the video with my structured NACA 12 video i probably have an aspect ratio larger than 35 but it's okay because the flow is happening in the direction of these mesh cells are very long and skinny but the flow is happening in that direction and so it's kind of okay in that case a growth ratio refers to the change in volume from one cell to another cell generally the smaller the better um, I usually keep it around 1.1 but you can play around with it but generally studies have shown that you shouldn't go above 1.2 uh, it's good to remind people that meshing can take long, it can take many, many hours and days possibly for larger simulations. And so the stronger the computer, uh, the better. If you have access to a, you know, 64, 128 core computer, that would be amazing. That'd help you a lot. Um, if you run it on my laptop with eight cores, it might take you much longer. So especially for clubs, um, you guys likely have a CFT dedicated computer. Make sure you guys use that. If not, look to see if your university or company has a dedicated high powered computer or supercomputer to run your safety simulations on. Next step is setting up the solver. This is really the setup to the setup. Um, so you want to select the dimensions, whether it's two dimension, three dimensions. This should be very straightforward. Um, you can also set up parallel processing. Parallel processing is when you kind of divide and conquer. You, if I believe I'm, um, if I recall correctly, you're literally dividing up the mesh and each processor solves a section of the mesh and it kind of puts it together at the end. But this might speed it up, but this actually also can introduce errors. Um, different applications have wildly different setups. And so it's probably best you see what other people in your field are doing before you play around with this too much. But I believe parallel processing for the most part is what everyone does. So setting it up on the solver, this is what my ANSYS Fluent um, kind of setup looks like. There's many settings you have to play around with. In my videos, I generally explain why I change certain uh, settings in the solver. So in the general part, you choose pressure de pressure based or, or density based. Generally, this is depending on your flow. For incompressible flow, you do pressure-based because the density is not changing. That's the definition of incompressible flow. However, if you're dealing with compressible flow, you have a velocity, you have air or a fluid that is changing density. So you want to use a density-based solver. Um, you want to choose if you want steady state or transient so, uh, solvers. Transient is if you want to actually see how things change in time, whether it's vortex shedding, you want to see the eddies, you want to see um, the you know time changing evolution of a fluid system but for general drag lift analysis steady state works probably the best and it's probably what you're looking for um, another thing is the energy equation the energy equation is really only used when you want to turn on when you want to do heat transfer or combustion type problems from there you want to see how you solve for the viscous terms the viscous terms are part of what you need to solve for in the turbulent model equations. There are several equations that I'm not gonna go into, but the most common for basic solutions and basic problems are the splart on Mars equation and the K omega and K epsilon equations. There are different forms of these equations, such as K omega SST and the K epsilon with their wall functions. There are several different wall functions. There are standard wall functions, enhanced wall functions, um, and far and wide in between. There's also higher order equations that also have transitional models. You have LES and DES, which I mentioned I would not go into. However, in general, the more robust model, the better accuracy, uh, but also the increased computational demand. 
Some models also work better with certain flows, um, certain segregated flows or separated flows. Some work better in other types of flows. So it's important that you look to see uh, what type of equations often used in your field. So I know in general, people will use K epsilon or K omega. K epsilon people will use that for separated flows, certain types of separated flows. And, but I believe K omega solves the, <clears throat> the it actually solves the viscous sub layers. And so K omega is kind of my most common solver. And it does really well for bounded flows um, and also some separated flows. But also as a reminder, in general, all models don't do high degrees of separation with high degrees of accuracy because separation is something very complex and the models only kind of do it and it depends on what situation. From there, once you choose your model, you want to define your fluid. In most cases, probably air or water, um, assuming you can double check its properties. Uh, maybe you're dealing, you're dealing with hot air or hot water. You want to change the temperature, make sure the viscosity and everything is in line with what you want. From there, you want to define the boundary conditions, which you can see in here. There are several different boundary conditions that have a huge role <laughs> on your fluid system. If it's a wall, such as an airfoil, you want to make sure you have a specified shear or no slip condition. If it's a normal wall like an airfoil, you probably want a no slip condition, but it's in cases where if you're doing FE or a formula car, you might want a specified shear. Um, you might even want a tangential velocity component where if it's a wheel, a wheel moving, um, you might actually want to define what the velocity is on that wheel to see it in a more realistic application. But for inlets, you can do velocity inlets, you can do pressure inlets. You can try to run a simulation where you know what the inlet velocity and pressure is and you can see how it changes and to see if there's a difference. You can also do mass flow inlet if you're doing like a compressible nozzle um, or some type of you know ejection type thing. You might want a mass flow inlet. There's pressure far fields, there's pressure outlets, there's many different bond conditions. And it's important that you actually read and understand these, these conditions um, in the ANSYS manual, which I will link. So there are several different bond conditions in my simulations. I've probably, in my tutorials, I've said why I choose certain bond conditions. But if I've chosen other ones, they probably will change the results. So going further, there are different, several different other things you can play around with. There's dynamic mesh, which allows for tra transient changes in the mesh. So if you want a mesh or geometry to actually change during a transient simulation, that's when you use a dynamic mesh. In the case of my NACA 12 uh, video where I simulated different angles of attack by changing the direction of the inlet, you actually could have done a dynamic mesh where you could have made the airfoil change itself. And that's something that would require, you know, that airfoil to rotate. And there are videos online somewhere of how to kind of do it, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, other things you can change around with and you probably want to set up are reference values. Reference values defines characteristic length. It defines your inlet velocity and things that are used to define coefficients of lift, drag, and other things that are used and for your report definitions. And so many times people ask me, what are your, what, uh, why are my reference values wrong? So I always want to check, make sure you are looking up your reference values and make sure they're set correctly. Make sure they correspond to the speed, velocity, viscosity, and everything that's appropriate. And as a reminder, reference length or reference area depends on what you're simulating, whether it's 2D or 3D. I'm not going to go over all of them, but you can probably find them online um, such that a airfoil, the reference length is the core length. A car, I believe it is its um, top down area if you're looking at it from the top um, in 3D and so on and so on. There's other methods in the solution. You have coupled flow and simple flow slash segregated solvers. So something you should look up. It's talked about in the ANSYS model or ANSYS um, tutorial or sorry, uh, guide. And 
there's a lot of resources online about it. Uh, there's also different orders in the methods that you can see for the viscosity terms, um, the turbulent terms. In general, higher order uses a, a larger stencil or larger kind of Taylor expansion, and it allows for more accuracy. However, there's a larger computational demand. So sometimes people always say use higher order, use second order, third order. But sometimes the first order is, you know, if you if there's no difference between the first and second order, then you can just use the first order. But it's something you might want to play around with to make sure that on your first order or second order that you're getting as most accurate um, of a result that you can. Next, you want to set up your report definitions. Re report definitions are where you tell the computer to also calculate drag, lift, shear stress, and things like that. And those are kind of the characteristic values of how you kind of uh, gauge, you know, what your aerodynamic body is doing, which hopefully you guys are well aware of. Uh, monitors are used for numerical, kind of for numerical sakes. You want to see how, you know, the error or how the continuity or how lift is changing with each iteration. And this is kind of how you gauge co convergence. If you see a physical value like pressure or lift, not changing after any iterations, that means it's finally converged. And that's generally how people convert, how ga people will gauge convergence. Um, however, convergence and these monitors are dependent on also mesh quality and many other factors. Um, initialization refers to the initial condition given for an iterative method, as you learned in partial differ differential equations or any type of a math applied math class, um, you need to give a solver an initial condition in addition to boundary conditions for it to actually solve something. So initialization is how you, you give it an initial condition. You can either manually do it or in Fluent you can do a hybrid initialization, which I don't really know honestly what it does. However, I know that generally it works pretty well. Um, so in theory, the initial condition shouldn't matter to the final condition. But sometimes you might run into stability issues if you give a bad initial condition. From there, you're kind of left at that run calculation button um, where you set in steady state the number of iterations you want to do. Uh, and you can stop it, you know, before all of it. So sometimes I just, I set it to overkill. I set 10,000 iterations, even though I know it will solve in a few thousand, just so I can run the simulation and do some other work knowing that when it stops, it will be my final correct answer. Um, you can also do, do transient simulations where you have to define your time step size. Um, so how much further in time do you time step it and how many iterations per time step? So from there, it's the computer just doing the solving. Convergence is based, as I mentioned, on no changes after each iteration. Um, and you can monitor it in some type of way, such as the monitors. And so this kind of looks what basic convergence might look like. You might want to run it for more, but this is what you want to see. <clears throat> In reality, you might see simulations diverge or oscillate. Oscillating might not be a bad idea or m might not be a bad um, monitor because if your flow is highly unsteady, such as, tra such as um, separated flow, it will oscillate because the nature of separated flow is transient. So if you're trying to find a steady state solution on a transient flow, you will see the monitors oscillate up and down because the perfect amount of energy, I guess, is you know somewhere in some type of separated flow and it wants to oscillate, but you're trying to kind of force it into a steady state. So what you end up seeing is you just see a oscillating residual. And that's basically what you want to see. As long as it oscillates around a constant value, that probably means that's the best you're going to get. And so people ask me a lot, especially for airfoils or some type of flow, if you increase the angle of attack at the separate, the moment it starts to separate before it reaches full separation, the solution will not converge to a steady solution. It will oscillate because you're trying to force it into a, you know, a constant value, but it doesn't because it's the onset of separation. So it's not fully separated. It's not fully attached. And when it tries to solve all of these complicated equations, it just oscillates um, between fully separated and separate and non-separated. 
uh, but you also can have it diverge and divergence requires troubleshooting and can be caused by a multitude of reasons including bad mesh quality numerical issues um, stability due to the models due stability due to um, you know your k epsilon equation k omega equation people generally will say k omega is more accurate but you can run into stability issues with certain meshes and certain applications. Um, a lot of times I've done heat transfer problems, like my compressible flow tutorial, I ran into heat, or I ran into stability issues, but there's really a million possible reasons. And so you kind of might want to play around if you're running into, generally what I actually recommend is if you're running into stability issues, play around with the solver. A little bit you can try to use a simple solver which has better stability than a coupled solver you can use series processing which also kind of helps stability a little bit but if nothing in the solver helps then it's probably the mesh and so maybe you have high skewness maybe you have um, you know large growth you have large pressure gradients you have um, shapes of cells next to each other changing drastically then you can run into divergence issues too um, from there you could do post processing post processing uh, I have a little video here is kind of a fun part you know assuming you have the correct answer this is where you can display vorticity and pressure contours um, but my favorite is displaying the ISO surfaces of vorticity which is known as usually people use Q criterion or lambda 2 um, in this case it's probably Q criterion or lambda 2, one of the two, and you can show on the surfaces the velocity or some other thing that you think looks best. So this is not my video. I cite the YouTube video here if you want to check it out. And so talking more about the errors, there are generally, in my opinion, four types of numer four types of errors in CFT. There are numerical errors that occur because you're doing an iterative method to approximate values of the governing equations. You learn this in, you know, basic A applied math class, but in Euler method, in um, Jacobian methods, and any type of numerical method, there's always some type of error, whether it's local or global error, and this is also part of CFD, and it's something that you can choose the best, you can use the largest tensor, you can use the quote-unquote best numerical method there's always going to be an error somehow and it's it's just something to be conscious of sometimes this error might be negligible sometimes it might not be and it really depends on the type of simula simulation you're doing um, a very common thing people get is the floating point error this is kind of like the windows blue screen of death to be honest it's it's something that you can't fix it's due to I believe what I read somewhere is basically instant convergence whether in a cell um, or somewhere that just makes the whole <laughs> simulation blow up so you won't even see the convert you won't see the monitors change you will simply see an error saying floating point error um, and yeah that's simply the nature of the error some other errors are due to coupled and simple flow parallel processing relaxation factors and things like that so there's always a trade-off with these errors. Um, another type of error is modeling. This is something that's integral and simply the nature of CFT and the nature of the Navier-Stokes equation when you're solving RANS, LES, and DES simulations. And it's that the governing equations in the turbulent models do not actually present uh, represent reality. They are very good approximation approximations of reality. However, they are not analytical solutions. You know, they're not like um, Newton's laws of you know a ball when you drop a ball they will it will always obey gravity you know I'm simplifying I'm not I'm kind of ignoring you know quantum physics and some of these other obscurities but uh, the governing equations and the turbulent models do not perfectly explain turbulent equate turbulent flow and so it's just to be wary about that and to know that one when one turbulent model works bad, better or worse for certain flows. Um, in addition, another error is a meshing error. So meshing errors 
something that might come when you discretize a fluid system into s smaller cells, whether it's, you know, skewness or mesh quality. Um, this is another for, uh, source of error. And the last error is, you know, the solver error. These are the frustrating ones when Fluent or Star CCM or MATLAB is kind of dumb. You know, I've had people tell me that, you know, they one day the simulation works, the next day they don't touch anything, but the simulation doesn't work or it diverges or something like that. And do we know why? No, I have no idea. They have no idea. And so sometimes, you know, you just got to be persist persistent or play around. So these are all different types of errors. And I can't always help you. The smartest safety person in the world possibly can't help you. Um, and that's just the reality. So in conclusion, CFD is a very powerful tool. It's something that is very accurate in some cases, only okay accurate in other cases, but it should be integral um, and integrated to the mechanical design process for aerodynamic surfaces. There were times that I worked at a company and uh, before we wanted to prototype something, if we wanted to get a gist of how this design will work compared to other designs, instead of actually spending the money and time to manufacture something, we can design it up in CFD and simulate it to see how well it works. But it's very important to know the validity and limitations of CFT. So I've attached this video. So one of my favorite CFT videos of what an, a Boeing 777 noise landing gear will look like. And this corresponds to vorticity. And so to see this microscopic, you know, very small scaled, um, you know, the vortex that corresponds to the noise is really cool. This is just a pretty picture. And you can see how, you can only imagine how small the cells are. And they basically had to use a supercomputer for this. If you're more interested in learning about the history of CFD and how it's affected and helped Boeing and other companies, I recommend reading this 30 years of development and application of CFT at Boeing Commercial Airplanes in Seattle. Um, these are by AIAA, um, I think fellows, very prominent people that have established a career at Boeing um, and in the aerospace industry. So hopefully in this video, I've kind of walked you guys through the basic math um, of RAND's models and basic CFT and the kind of workflow where you start with the geometry, you make a mesh and you set up the solver. And I've maybe explained some of the basics that I didn't explain as in depth in some of the other videos. So this kind of is like the video before starting my other tutorials. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. This might be the last video I do in a little bit, but hopefully it's really helpful. Um, yeah, first time I've shown the math here, but um, geometry, meshing, setting up the solver, post-processing are always integral and part of the CFT process and it doesn't really change. You know, you always will follow those types of steps and hopefully I've helped you become a smarter, better CFT engineer. Thank you.